services of, uh, of, of Great Lent, and uh, each of us was assigned a community, and we were kind of playing round robin and uh, going to different communities and speaking to the congregants there. So it's a nice opportunity uh, for us to speak to a different audience. Um, and we thank you for making the effort uh, to attend these, these lectures. And this evening we have a very, very uh, special speaker, special not only to you, but also special to me, uh, Father Nikiforos Fakinos from uh, St. Demetrius and Merrick. Uh, I know Father Nikiforos longer than I don't know him. So I met him at the age of 16. Uh, and if you don't like me as a priest, blame him. Uh, because he was, he was uh, my inspiration and he cultivated my calling. And I thank him for that. So it's nice to have him here. I grew up listening to the sermons. Now I just uh, listen to my own sermons. Uh, but it's nice to have him here to speak to us about the uh, service of the Lent and Vespers of Contrition, Catanicus uh, Perinus, which is something that we do on Sunday nights. Um, it's somewhat of a lost service, but thankfully the Archbishop wants us to reignite this tradition. Um, so we're going to learn more about this service this evening with Father Nicoforos. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father Theophany, for the beautiful introduction. And uh, it is true indeed that I do know him since he was 16 years old. Uh, and uh, he has uh, made me very proud, not just as his spiritual father, but also uh, as a fellow priest who sees uh, the great uh, growth and the great progress that he has uh, accomplished uh, for the glory of God. And I would like to thank you all for coming to this and participating in this lecture tonight which is dedicated to one very, very significant service of the Church, the Vespers of Contrition, or Catalicticos Esperinos. I will tell you first my impressions. When I arrived in this country in 1990, and I was looking for a parish that celebrated that service, and I could not find in a great, great radius of hundreds and hundreds of miles, I could not find a single virus that celebrated and observed this beautiful, beautiful tradition. We knew about the first uh, Vespers of Contrition, uh, which is also called the Vespers of Forgiveness, but not the others that are assigned to their respective London Sundays. And it was something that to a great extent, I was looking forward, since I was a young uh, a man in Greece and a young boy, I was looking forward to the services and I could not find them uh, anywhere in, in the vicinity. Uh, gladly, with the grace of God, I was ordained and appointed a priest in uh, St. Demetrius in Astoria, in the cathedral, where we did have those services. And when I came to New York, I was blessed and honored and privileged to be able, as a priest, to celebrate the Vespers of Contrition every Sunday during Lent. Not only that, as Father Zafani has mentioned before, to also have our new Archbishop, His Eminence Archbishop of the Forest of America, come and reignite the flame and revive this forgotten service so that it is celebrated throughout the district. And not only that, just last Sunday, we had over 30 priests in the neighboring parish of Holy Resurrection, His Eminence Archbishop of Pilohoros presiding, and throughout all the London journey, we had beautiful participation from clergy and lady, and the service is coming back into the forefront as a great way to experience and express our London journey. And therefore, it is the prospect of tonight's lecture to try and analyze and understand the structure, the meaning, the theological value of this beautiful service, and to also see why it is so uplifting and so inspirational. And again, we extend and we express our gratitude to His Eminence for reviving this beautiful service. And by next year, we hope and pray that every parish will celebrate it and more and more people will be able to receive additional blessings and edification, spiritual edification 
from this beautiful service. In conjunction uh, with this uh, confirmed uh, conviction for the celebration of the service of the Catholic Post Esperinos, I would like to go into a little of an etymological understanding and comprehension of what the word means. Catalicticos Esperinos. The noun mixis from the ancient word that translates to kendo, simbo, I make an incision. I cut something and I make a domini, a, a, a cut, in order to get something through. Nixis. Catanixis is the process of cutting through our muscles in great contrition to reveal the presence of God in our souls and to allow His grace to be immersed in our existence and to surrender our lower passions in order to uplift into the spiritual realm. This is achieved through intense prayer called Kadhyaki Prosakhi, a prayer that is immersed with our whole heart and understanding in calmness, in stillness, with inner peace, and with a humble, serene meditation of Orthodox worship. The second word, esperinos, in English translated usually as vespers, is emanates from the word espera, for evening. And also the fact that the evening is in the Orthodox tradition, the beginning of the new day, which is uh, very, very not analogous to what we have been raised in a Western society to start our day with sunrise. The Byzantine tradition, very closely correlated to the Judaic tradition, it begins with sunset, and that's how the cycle of the day is uh, attributed with the first service of the new day being the Vespers. And that's when you notice when we celebrate, uh, when you come to St. Demetrius, to celebrate St. Demetrius, you come on October 24th and you start celebrating from the Vespers. Christmas Eve, same thing. You come December 24th and we celebrate Christmas Eve from the Vespers, from the evening service, and so on and so forth. Vespers is counted among the seven prayer stations of the 24 hours of the church, which stations are known by the functional term night and day services, or else akolutheus to nichthimen. This is exactly relevant to the Judaic prayer cycle, which is referenced in the book of Psalms. Evening and morning and noon, I recite and recount my voice is heard. You notice the details, evening and morning and noon, the cycle of the day of the Psalms. This prayer for practice of evening prayers is later witnessed also in the ancient church because the Lord himself will observe these practices and they were passed on by the Lord to the apostolic era, the patristic era, etc. the Orthodox faith. The late professor Ioannis Kondouli is the foremost expert in teleturgics will uh, tell us that the, four, that, 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 that the three types of vespers are distinguished as the ordinary celebratory, which includes biblical readings after the entrance, the small the vespers, which has a psalter and biblical readings, and the solemn, uh, great solemn vespers, which is conjoined with an evening divine liturgy. From this somewhat crude categorization, we can extract as a rule that most vespers of Lent are celebrated without an entrance, apart from the Patrician Vespers and the presented by the Lutheran. We'll get into this. So we have the Patrician Vespers, the daily Vespers, without the presented by the Lutheran in Lent. We have the presented by the Liturgy Vespers, the third category. We have the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil with the Vespers. All these are different ways to conduct our evening prayers. All are very effective, but Orthodox worship is very logical. And everything happens for a reason. So, with the exception of the 
daily uh, services, all of them have an entrance. And we will see what the entrance means and symbolizes. You see other boys coming during the Vesper service. We will also investigate that. The Contrition Vespers is also introduced, just like the other services, with the priest invoking God, blessed be our God, and Leviticus of Theos. And then we make three prostate, prostrations, metanias. I love the Greek word, metania, prostrations. You don't know what it means. Metania, it tells you what, it, what purpose it serves. Metanome, and we get to that. And then the prostos, in last Sunday service, that was the Archbishop, his eminence, will read Psalm 103, also called the Proiniakos, or preliminary psalm. It is the psalm that introduces us to the entire theological and spiritual atmosphere of Vespers, in proportion to the role played by the hex of psalm in the orthos, the exapsalos in the orthos. In fact, the Vesper service begins with Proiniakos, since the liturgical road, Imos, begins with Vespers. Pro Imiakos. Like I said before, everything is very logical. So the first psalm that we will read for full of prayers throughout the day, Pro Imiakos, is the beginning of the path of prayers that we will follow the entire day. The Imos, Omicron Yoda, which translates from Isaac Greek as the road, the road of prayers. And it starts from sun uh, set until the next day sunset. We embark on the spiritual journey of daily prayers, and then during all the Lent, the Vespers of Contrition begin on the evening of Jesus' first Sunday, but it is really a service of Clean Monday. They're called the Vespers of Clean Monday, So the first Lenten service is the Vespers of Contrition, or people call them Vespers of Forgiveness. The actual service is divided in two parts. We will, we will examine that as well. In ancient times, the Proemia Post, Psalm 103, was either chanted or intoned. And now we kept only for festive celebrations the chanting of the Alexandaria, beautiful, beautiful part from the verse 28b, Anixandosu Tihira, opening your head, the symbol of the of Christotos, the entire world is replenished, is fulfilled with your grace. The late professor Yannis Kudu is referring to the content of this song, incorporated the highly lyrical language. It describes the creation of the world the magnificence of this creation. And the Creator, who wears light like a garment, who stretches the sky like a tent, and walks on the clouds, where He created the angels and founded the earth. He set the boundaries to the sea and built the mountains. He caused the springs and rivers to flow, where He waters the earth with His rain, where He commanded the grass and trees grow, and He filled the earth with birds and animals. And all this for the enjoyment and the embarrassment of the person, the human being, which is the crown jewel of creation. And that's the dynamic proportion of God's creation. It's still the movement and progress and evolution of creative wisdom with beginning and with end. The day evolves from the origin, the sunset, just the creation begun from darkness. Ex nihilo, as the Latin say, from nothing. And then came light. Then came life. The first movement of creation. And according to the Orthodox calendar, the Vespers from sunset is the beginning of the new day, where the sun reigns and people and animals seek the rest. Again, the moment of life rises and resumes. Your works have been magnified, O Lord. 
Ya Rabbi, everything in utter wisdom. Os e megalin fita e besukiria, Panda and Sophia and Jesus. So great and so beautiful. And he continues to describe the great works of God as, as poetically. The sea and the things in it, the earth and her indescribable providence under the almighty protection of God. This wonderful song is recited by the church at the time of sunset because its characteristic phrases are mentioned in it. The sun is setting, let there be darkness, and let the night be. The content of this song shows God with incomparable plasticity as the creator of the world and attempts to represent his creation, narrating the beauty and the greatness of the cosmos. Cosmos in a cosmima, a jewel of paramount beauty, like nothing else we could ever imagine God made it. And the saving grace of the Logos permeates all this. The recitation of the Caribbean Cos stimulates feelings of admiration for the Creator and also gratitude for the creation. That's his bequest. That's his inheritance to us. The reading of the psalm is, after all, a prayerful oration of his benevolence, a testament of law, and an expression of admiration for his magnificence. Saint Isaac the Syrian speaks of burning the moral creation. A law for creation is a law for the Creator. Respecting his gift expresses honor to the one who made and offered the gift. If I give someone something, and I find it with a trust that shows disrespect to me. But if I give something to a person as a present, and they respect it and cherish it, that shows respect to me as well. So as humans, as we treat the cosmos, the gift of God, a heart of mercy is burning heart of our own creation, says Isaac the Syrian. I pray for humans and birds and animals and angels and overall creation. From the memory and the vision of whose eyes fear flow, and from the contrition of the heart of the benevolent, who shrinks from sympathy and mercy, and cannot see or hear any harm or sorrow happening in creation. And for this reason, both for the non-reasoning beings and animals, as well as the reasoning and the enemies of the truth, for those who harm it, he prays at all times, with plentiful tears, that God will protect them and have mercy on them. He also prays for the reptiles as from the standpoint of his benevolence, which emanates from his heart in an immeasurable manner, in the likeness of God. Why don't people write and read to you this way anymore? Saint Isaac the Syrian speaks with such love about the creative cosmos. Saint Siluanos also talks about the effect of God's grace on a struggling person, which makes him a universal man, as he calls him. Since he now prays for the whole of humanity and even for the entire creation, even for the animals and the plants and the rivers and the mountains and the soil. In this way, worship interprets the greatness of God in history and gives it the necessary theological dimension. It relates and adopts them to its own life and to the life of the people. And finally, it brings the events of history to life, not as a mere repetitive custom, but as a form of supreme transport of the wonders of God in the history of the world. During the reading of the spectacular 103rd Psalm, the priest recites in the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary, inaudibly for the people, the blessings of Lichnikos, and the blessings that are contained therein, those blessings in ancient times used to be audible, but also uh, the presence and the participation of the people were, was most, more, mostly widespread. So we had the entire service, and for each small synapse, uh, synapse, uh, synapse uh, extended or large synapse, the deacon will uh, say the petitions and then the priest will say those prayers of the Lichnikos. Unfortunately, most Pharisees did not have a deacon and for this reason and for the uh, assistance of the priest so that he can 
without destruction, recite his prayers and pray his blessings, they are done during the reading of the prayer of Yaakos. And I'm very, very happy that I came across one of the articles of the late Johannes Kerubis, who actually said that the seven antiphons of the Asmatic Vespers, the ancient form of Vespers, were uh, emphasized, <coughs> and he calls an incorporation of the Asmatic Vespers in our contemporary church. In other words, for the people to participate in the service and pray together and even chant together and say those readings together, which is a, a blessing when people have the knowledge and all the chanting, obviously. And uh, even with another initiative, which is evidence of biblical photos, to have teachable catechetical liturgies and services of such beautiful, beautiful uh, grandeur like the Vespers, and be able to tell the people, explain to the congregation, the faithful, what the service is all about, what everything means, and with the grace of God, they can chant it along, they can pray it along, or understand it a bit better. The priest reciting these prayers does not only act as a representative of the ecclesiastical community to which he belongs, but he symbolizes Adam standing in front of the gates of paradise as he stands in front of the royal gates. Christ is our Savior and Redeemer, and with his prayers, the priest deepens and strengthens his self-awareness like Moses in Sinai. Or even according to the example of the Savior in the Garden of Gethsemane, ensuring that mercy, grace, and blessings are provided for himself and for the congregation. Now, the services of contrition follow the thematology, the themes of Great Lent. Each week of Great Lent has certain themes assigned to it. First week is fasting, second week is the parable of the prodigal son, third week is the publican and the Pharisee, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. But during Triodio, you see all these themes. The replacement of the original themes with new ones happened later in the Cosmic novel and in a gradual way from the 6th to the 14th century, according to Professor Kudulis. And accordingly, the rest of the hymns are supplemented with those prescribed by the Mineo. The important thing to realize and remember is that, in great respect, those ancient themes are carried through in the prayers, in the hymns of the Kekragaria, the Kyria Kekraksa. And we notice, for instance, that the, the first uh, two weeks we do Patrician Vespers and we chant hymns of the Prodigal Son. It's almost like instead of having the Sunday of the Prodigal Son extended to two weeks instead of just one week. The beautiful Kekragaria, introduced by the Kyrie Kekraksa, uh, are chanted as the deacon offers the incense. The incense represents a sacrifice an aromatic gift of prayer offered by the people and ascending to heaven to reach the recipient of our prayers, God, worshiping as an opportunity for communication with God and for bringing the worship community together, the synaxis. So we come in union, communion with God through the worship of the earthly and the heavenly, the human with the divine, the created with the uncreated, the tied with the eternal, the fallen with the risen. This is a transport of our souls and minds away from this world and from these secular cares and uplifting our real as it gravitates away from the earthly frictions and cares of life and assumes its journey of salvation. The incense is offered as we chant the melodious Latin hymns replete with deep theological content and rich spiritual values. The Lenten hymnology is followed by the Kikaragaria hymns from the Mineo regarding the saints of the Feast of the Day and concluded by the Luxistikon and the Thabakion in honor of the Holy Trinity and the Thabakos. The first country is Vespers, as was said, is also called by the people as Vespers of Forgiveness or Spiritosis Economis, and it's replete with such poetic expressions. The tradition of exchanging forgiveness at the conclusion of the church, of the service, is a later development, 
not entirely liturgically accurate or efficient because oftentimes the people that need to forgive and be forgiven are not in the church, are not present in worship, but rather it has become a ritualistic uh, ethos, ethical custom, and the church instead would invite an actual progress of forgive, pro process of forgiving our fellow brothers and sisters, reaching out and becoming a vessel of grace and salvation for them. In that spirit, the first Kekragario of the Stichira, the hymns that are prefixed by the verse of the psalm, poetically expresses, I intended, O Lord, to erase the blood of all my debts and to please you with repentance for the rest of my life. But the enemy fools me and wages wherefore against my soul. Save me before I utterly perish, O Lord my God. Beautiful hymn. Beautiful hymn. It's like I said about forgiveness. These first four hymns are called Catalytica, according to the definition that we said before the Catalytica Spiritus. And following are the three hymns, the Lenten hymns of the Triodio, and the three hymns from the Mineo. The Mineo is the book for each, it's one of the 12 books for each month of the year, and it includes uh, the, the hymns of the saints, the lives of saints, the Synaxarium, etc., and all the feasts. Now, the word that the Triodio is not just a book, it's an actual season of the church. It's called Triodio as a reference to the three odes, the three odes of land. And it starts and passes the spiritual season, ecclesiastical season for the Sunday of Public and the Paris, and they'll call it week leading to the Passion of our Lord and Savior. It emphasizes prayer, repentance, humility, philanthropy, and mercy. First and foremost, as we have concluded with the third key of the Luxasticon, we are now witnessing the entrance. The outer servers lead the way, holding lanterns, candles, lit candles. That is referencing to the old ancient apostolic time, when we were under persecution when all the services were in the evening, in fear for getting, for Christians getting caught. And the outer service will lead the way and bring lanterns and come and approach and bring uh, the, uh, the, the beginning of the service. So this element, this characteristic from uh, the Vespers is also relevant to the two divergent uh, characteristics of Orthros and Vespers. The one being that is more aligned with the New Testament and the other one with the Old Testament. The incense which is spoken of in the entrance prayer is a symbol of prayer offered in honor and glory of Christ and his presence in the world is also shown through the entrance uh, before Fosilaro. As the priest stands in the center, he says, Sophia or Thee, wisdom arise, the people rise and rises the holy, the incense, and then chants Fos Ilaro, O Joyful Light, an ancient hymn, which is very theological, very Trinitarian, the rest of Christ. And that joyful light of the glory of the Heavenly Father, which also expresses both the distinction of the three verses, as well as their unity. We praise Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God. The text of the hymn reveals that it was composed and introduced probably around the third and fourth century during the Trinitarian Christological controversies in the church. In Christian antiquity, the hymn was chanted when the Apostolitis, that first star, is visible in the sky. The Apostolitis is the first star that we see on uh, a nice summer night in Greece. And the congregation will now, at that time, 
and light the lamps to dispel the coming darkness of night. Very symbolic also of Christians being the light of the world and dispel the darkness of evil and unbelief. An imitation of the ancient rite of illumination is the leading lighted candle, or even better, the well known rite of the sanctified divine liturgy, with the utterance, Light of Christ is visible everywhere, Fos Christu Feni Passi. The elements of the Vespers are typically and a basic difference from the other elements. The small elements in the Grand Liturgy was the entrance of the clergy and people from outside the temple into the temple. The great entrance to God as an entrance and a transfer of the sacred gift, gifts from the vault outside the temple to the priest waiting on the royal gates. Now the entry of Vespers is preceded by the entry of the priest into the royal gates for the offering of incense and the ritual lighting of the lamp, Lichnikos, within the holy sanctuary. And then in general terms, the entire Vesper services symbolize the era of the Old Testament. That's why it ends with Simeon and the beautiful prayer of the elder Simeon. Me na polis to do this Vesper. Now let your servant depart in peace, O Lord. It's corresponding to the service of Orthros, which begins with an angelic New Testament reference. Glory to God in the highest. Doxalipsis is the only reason in our Dox of the Kia. Remember? From Christmas, from the beautiful Nativity service. Now it's parallel in the time of the New Testament, like we said before. Vesper's Old Testament, Orthodox morning service, New Testament. According to Simeon of Thessaloniki, the address with the incense, the Lord is symbolized in the person of the priest, while in the address, when the priest is quoting the gospel, the gospel symbolizes the Lord, because the gospel is the perfect icon of Christ containing his words and works. And obviously, better than any icon represents his teachings and his offering into our lives. And uh, it's the good spell, gospel, good spell, evangelio, caloangelma, the good news of salvation, the process the procession of the priest means the descent of Jesus into the world. Standing in the middle of the solea, the bile of the head, of the head and the prayer of the entrance remind us of the Lord's life for our own people, his earthly ministry, and then the Lord being humiliated, humbled, and offering through kenosis, through the empty of his nature, the human nature, as a perfect theanthropos, perfect human, perfect God be led to crucifixion and passion for our salvation. This last is symbolized in the standing position of the priest and the lifting of the gospel or the incense, the resurrection, the rise, the triumph, the victory. However, the serenity of the of the Latin season implies and mandates that the hymn Fossil Aron, Joy of Life, is entoned and simply Read, not chanted as in the festive verses. Immediately after Fosinaron, we have the most recognizable part of the contrition service, which is the Mega Perkimero, when the royal gates close, the lights dim down. And then we see a huge transformation inside the church. The priest will change the altar covers, the vestments of the priest will change from the glorious and festive resurrection of colors, bright colors of Sunday, to the sorrowful mellow, simple Lenten colors. The gospel on the holy altar table will be reversed from facing the icon of the resurrection to face the icon of the crucifixion. And then we will hear this beautiful Perkimenon, which is chanted according to uh, the mode of 
Bruselas, a los Bruselas para los lavatarios, en el slow apatipol menos. Mi amos crepes esto proso poso, apotipedoso, dislivo me, tajie para los son, proses de psiquismo que hay en los apil. Do not turn away your face away from your child, for I am sorrowful. Here is speed, give heed to my soul and redeem it. The cry of despair of every human, every faithful person who acknowledges personal limitations, failures, and sins is expressed in this prayer. Through this solemn and truly melodious chant, as we bow down and implore our Lord and Savior to save us. As mentioned before, this is the mega procurement of the contrition uh, Vespers in all the Vespers except for one. For the third Sunday, we have the different procurement and the Vesperia Romina that spoke of Manus Dona Master Kyrie. You gave inheritance to those who are in awe of your name, O Lord. On the same theme of hopeful optimism, the hymnographer emphasizes that those who are in awe of the Lord, the faithful who observe his will and commandments, will be recipients of his heavenly requests. Such inheritance is received not because we deserve it, but because we are his children. Not one of us is worthy of his kingdom or salvation. Our faults are more than our triumphs. Rather, we receive an inheritance, not a salary. A salary is the due reward for our benevolent deeds. An inheritance is the gift of a close relationship. A child receives such requests because of their relation to the father. It does not mean that this child is better than other children. It's just because of the relationship to the father. How do we maintain a relationship? Worship is a great way. Communion, communication, that's how we stay close to the father. And of course, acts of benevolence help and, and our personal testimony through life of the faith helps, but it is our relationship that is rewarded, not our deeds. We're not Boy Scouts. We are faithful. So, according to the rubrics of the Vespers of the Christian, Prakimen is followed by the extended supplication, which during the Patrician Vespers is shortened, and it leads up to a bed that he spoke, and ends there. Why? For the simple fact that this is a Lenten service, a more contrite service, more solo. The extended supplication would automatically make a correlation to an Arcoclesia or a festive Vespers, and that's why we take all these other petitions off, and we slim down to the service to the basics, and then continue with the Pilotica, which are personal invocations, imploring the Lord to save us, to help us, to forgive our sins. A very intimate prayer is this. And then, in between the Pleiotica and the Extended, we have the Cataxia, so make us worthy, O Lord, which is a beautiful, again, inspired by the Psalms prayer that is concluded with the reference to the Holy Trinity. Then, we have the conclusion of the prayer of Kephaloclesia, the bowing of the head supplication, which again is symbolized as theologically that spiritual orientation of the entire Vesper service in a tone of optimism. But again, as we ask the mercy of God, God is only for that. We submit to His will and to His grace, to His mercy. The prayer of God are beautiful, beautiful. Uh, uh, petitions that we have found as far back as the 4th and 5th century in the orders of the apostles we have found references to them and they are followed by the apostica beautiful hymns of the Vespers after the prayer of Kephalopecia I would like to only now that we are almost to the end of the explanation of the Vespers make one distinction and speak about one of these hymns, one of these apostica, my personal favorite. 
Kalikus abobtisas Spartacus astado fredi My mind was restless I threw off my father's pride And I cohabitated with beastly and sinful thoughts Squandering all I had in no living Rest that I am I forsook the food that fulfills the heart And I filled up feeding on the pleasures of carnal passions That kept me still hungry O good father, I beg you Do not close your philanthropic embrace to me But open your arms and accept back Like the prodigal son And save me This is so beautiful, so poetic And that's the beauty of this service it Speaks to the heart it Speaks to our inner emotions No trying to pretend here we are who we are. We stand before God who knows who we are. And just say, save me. I've done everything I could wrong. Save me. And just like the prodigal son, we have fallen into the fault of apostasy. Apostasy is a compound word. Comes from the preposition from and the word stand, to stand away from, in this case, God. It means departure. According to sociology, the term apostasy refers to the renunciation and exercise of criticism or opposition to a religion or to a family. And apostasy for the prodigal son was from his family. So, when a person leaves the church, they don't leave an organization, they leave a family, they leave their father. According to the teaching of the church, a person of most asylums moves away from God, his father, when he chooses voluntarily and freely to cut off any spiritual bond and communication with his creator. That's why we cannot stay away from communion or the sacraments for too long according to the canons of the church. That's an act of apostasy. Or stay away from the church too long. It's an act of apostasy. Freedom was exercised by the prodigal son. He was free. He left his father and explored a life in his own terms, with the sole purpose of pleasure and gratification. A human seeking the vacation without his provider, without God that is, places himself or herself as sole ruler and administrator of life. So instead of saying, Thy will be done, that human says, my will be done. And of course, that's the epicenter of modern um, humanitarian, anthropological, sociological, psychological uh, uh, movements. So that's a rebellion against God, not because God did not take care of him. God, God takes really good care of us. God the Father takes really good care of the prodigal son. Really good care. He gives him. He gives him everything he needs and more. But because he wants to do things that no, he knows are against God's will. So this is the apoxenosis. He goes to live in a foreign land to become exeno to his own father. And this is a way from the fatherly abode, from our lack of grace. Doubt, lack of trust in God, selflessness, curiosity, desire, inclination to sin, persuade the apostate to abandon the paternal embrace and the comfort and the security and the tranquility that God offers and to demand the inheritance. He asked for the epivalum menus to Susias, the prodigal son. He asked for the property, the wealth. Is it his? He's a child. He didn't work for it. It's his father's. He asked for the, for the inheritance. Is his father dead? When, do, when does somebody ask for inheritance after death? Why is he asking for an inheritance when his father is still alive? Because in his mind, 
His father is dead. The wishes of his father are not living in his heart. They're deadly. And he's asking for the epivalent verse to see us. Usia, very usia, they're correlated words in ancient Greek. The wealth, the treasure. But it's also the word essence, usia. He's asking for the essence. So, this verse is a person from God. It's the soul of, of such prerogatives. The devil is simply the moral author of this person's decisions. The fall into sin is therefore called the interruption of man and communion with the Father. Sin according to the Bible and the Holy Father is not the transgression of some harsh human law violated by humans and punished by God, but it is the interruption of the relationship between the created man and the uncreated God, a relation that is enriched by worship and interrupted by apostasy. That's why the word for sin in ancient Greek is more accurate, Amartia, which means astochia, missing the mark. And when we miss the mark, we have to keep trying until we make it. And that's more positive rather than the rather pessimistic word for sin. And then it happens. Good father, do not close my your philanthropic and benevolent embrace. Miklis is the philanthropic flag. Splat. Do you remember Yaya, Mama, those who were Greek speaking? They would call us Splatnomo because we came from our mother. Because our Yaya, our mother, they have made life that gave us life. Splatnomo. Which is also part of the embrace. When you hug somebody, you come back into the Splat. You become again. Where your words are used to be. Miklis is the philosopher's flag. Tata, the philosopher's flag. So, he's now experiencing metania, metano, change of mind, total change of life. And to change our mind, nous, metano, takes a lot of courage, patience, commitment. Man living in darkness of sin and ignorant of the beauty of divine life cannot understand the difference between human life and divine human life. So only with divine grace sows in his heart the seed of divine law. Mixes, remember? And then it goes mixes. We cut it to sow something inside. Then we can see the spiritual desolation. Sunlight, when it enters a dark room, reveals everything. But temporarily it blinds. Thus, when God's grace illuminates our souls, we see our inner desolation, our passions, our sins, everything we've done wrong, but it also hurts. It hurts. It takes a while for us to reconcile and transform to reach Metania. Because of this true repentance, the safe road that leads to the kingdom of God is paved by our strive, our struggle for salvation. Repentance is a new mindset. The Vespers of Contrition correspond to this strive for repentance in great humility and by the nixis, the tomi, the kari, of the heart to open and traverse into the realm of God's grace. Almost like the surgeon who cuts the heart to heal it. Yet he puts the knife inside the human body in the heart, that's the only way to save it. That's repentance. And this is how we make our heart new, how we make our faith, our life new. Metania legis, to misisa din amartia, ki agapisa din aretin. To hate sin is repentance. To love virtue is repentance. O metanon anthropos, Ex psychis di mena lathi prothesi, ke di samartia sextina fthani pos teo. Metania, repentance, will help us reach God. And then, we read this beautiful, beautiful uh, passage from St. Gregory Palamas. 
Την χάρη τη γνώση του δικείου να βάλει μάτρα, έπεται η οικία κατάγνωση. Self knowledge, acknowledgement of the faith, sorrow for the fall, contrition of heart, confession of sins, prayer and blessing, together with the promise of abstaining from evil and thus experiencing the gift of true repentance. True repentance in the new state of human life is accompanied by certain consequences that biblical and Christian language calls the fruits of repentance, the good things that come after. Τον αμαρτιών εξομολόγηση στι αρχέ τη καλλιέργεια τάφτη, that σοφοκλή οικονόμο in his ομιλίε, his operations, is talking about. Confession is not just a fruit of repentance, but also an opportunity to forgive. Say John of Orana, what we want to prevent. Say Gregory Palamas in his 23rd discourse emphasizes that. The man who truly lives in repentance does not turn back to the first seas, nor clings to persons and things of corruption, nor joins in dubious pleasures, despises the present, looks for the future, strives against the passions, pursues the virtues, watches in prayer, abstains from a just gain, forgives even those who sin against him. Is merciful to those who provoke him and ready to help by words, by works, by sacrifices, all those who need it. And when he exhorts Christians to apply their works of repentance, he emphasizes, above all, the humble life, sorrow, and spiritual mourning. Summarizing, in conclusion, all the characteristics of the Christian who lives in repentance, even as they are described in this beautiful tradition, Vespers. We see that it takes away the outcomes of apostasy and sin. The proximity of repentance to return so close to being imperceptible, like we see in the Psalm 103. Finally, the hymn of the righteous Simeon at the end of the Vespers. Now let your servant be dismissed, O Lord. Nina poli isto dulus no desto na katatorima su. When it's recited by the priest for himself, but also for his flock, it's the only prayer that is not followed by a hymn. And it says that, Lord, whenever you please, I can die because I became a partaker of the mystery of salvation which you offered and the church projects to experience through the holy service of the Vespers. Then, from what we analyzed thus far, it becomes clear that the Vesper service of contrition carries an enormous wealth of symbolism, theology, ritual, hymnology, psalmody, and unfortunately has been badly neglected and undervalued in our lives. Its emergence and its correct execution could have many benefits for today's faithful and especially for the Paris life. <clears throat> Even for our cultivation of self-awareness, we embark on the spiritual journey of great and holy land, first with the service of contrition investors. We'll connect that in the initial service of forgiveness, an attribute that has become a measure for our salvation. Entire Sundays have been dedicated to this God-inspired virtue. The parable of the evil servant who did not forgive the death of his fellow serves as a perfect reminder that forgiveness is key to the gates of heaven. Contrition Vespers eloquently poetically present the themes of forgiveness, humility, repentance, return from the apostasy of sin, and redemption in a hopeful way. Because the journey of land is indeed a fight for salvation through many obstacles. Christ emerged victorious from the empty tomb, but first suffered. Suffering and the ultimate humility of the cross on Golgotha. For its length of prostration in Greek Natania, leading to a personal conviction of repentance, we boil down and we rise up. We bend the knees, we make the sign of the cross as we bear our own cross. We accept the results of the failures, implore God for mercy, and then rise up. This is how Anatania 
is indeed a perfect symbol for that. It would take books, hundreds of pages, to analyze and present the hypnography of all these beautiful countries of Vespers for each one of the five Sundays. But we only analyzed two, three tonight. So, for the rest, I implore you, come and attend the services, cherish them, make the best of them, make the most of them. And the wealth is a way to be discovered, to be treasured, and to be invested for our benefit. The wealth of the Catalan.